we can get done today. Gotta do these four questions as fast as humanly possible and move on to my operating systems multi-threading assignment. Turns out multi-threading programs is a lot more challenging than you'd expect and constantly ending up in deadlock when things shouldn't be deadlocking is kind of painful. Still no updates from Google though, which is kind of cool, I guess. Um, no clue what's happening with that. It's been, I think, actually over a month now. So I'm not sure if slash when I'm getting team matched. It would have been cool if they told you pretty much like, hey, you're guaranteed a job offer. So then you can wait for team matching. But without the guarantee of a job offer, it makes declining other offers to wait for Google's team match kind of a gamble. So yeah, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. Alright, I'm not sure if anyone else is going to be joining, so let's go ahead and get started here. Largest number by two times. Given it a list of integers, return whether the largest number is bigger than the second largest number by more than two times. Okay. So, I mean, the obvious way, right, the very, very quick way to write here is an n log n solution, but I think, um, we, so we can do um, n log n, sort, and then take class 2. However, this is going to be slow, because we can technically, I think, bring this down to just the O of n solution by doing a O of n traversal. It's gonna take a bit more to write, but it'll be faster. So we're gonna do O of n traverse and two variables. Mm. Okay, two variables to keep track of biggest. There we go. So now what we can do is just do that and then compare those two and we've gone down a level of time complexity. So let's do int biggest equals nums at zero. Int second equals nums at zero as well. So we can just update it. Yep, and we're guaranteed nums to be longer than two. Okay. Um, I guess since we're guaranteed that, we can go ahead and do the declaration this way to say, um, so if uh, nums at zero greater than nums at one, we want zero to be biggest and one to be second biggest. Otherwise, we want it the other way around. Perfect. And this allows us to then start our loop from index three. Hey man, it's good to see you. Feel free to join the room with exclamation point up there. Solve some questions with us. Okay, so we're gonna do four int i equals two now. i is less than nums dot length. I plus plus. Cool. So we're gonna check to see if they're bigger than either the biggest or the second. So if nums at i is greater than biggest then second equals biggest and biggest is nums at i there we go and it's going to be very similar logic here so then else if if it's not bigger than the biggest, but it is bigger than second, we can do, uh, just replace second with it. Second equals nums, not in all caps, nums at i. So this should allow us to iterate through the entire array and in O of n, find two biggest. And 
then down here, we just need to check the condition that they're asking us for. So return um, biggest over second is greater than or equal to two. Pretty much saying, are, is the does second go into biggest at least two times? It might be a bit finicky with integer division, but we'll see. Cannot find symbol on line 20. Uh, chicken, chicken, chicken. <laughs> Uh, man, the chicken command has probably been by far my greatest addition. It's good to see you, man. Okay. Why can it not find... Mm, yeah, no, I'm a little bit dumb. When you declare these variables locally, they're gonna stay in the local scope. Cool. Let's make this zero. And let's also make this zero for now. Actually, we don't even need to make them zero. We can just declare them and allow the actual methods there to take care of it. So let's get rid of the integer declaration again. It's not going to be a pretty solution, but it's going to be a solution. There we go. I'll adjust the spacing on these as well. There we go. That should fix the error that we're having. Cool. And running that. Ooh, a divide by zero. Uh, I guess what we can say is to say um, if second equals zero, return false. But what happens if they're both zero? I I guess we're supposed to return true if we're dividing by zero. College life going honestly, it's been it's been pretty good. I mean, considering the fact that this is I believe week nine of the quarter. So, I've got this week, next week, and then finals week, and I'm out. However, multi-threading is absolutely kicking my butt and I have no idea what I'm doing for the most part especially when working in a low-level language like C to learn multi-threading there's a lot of smaller things you have to focus on like the assignment <laughs> very grown kid it's kind of it's kind of wild to think that I'm graduating with a with my four-year degree soon but yeah it's multi-threading is complicated because avoiding deadlock is weird like there's so many things to consider because your switch between threads can really happen at any point outside of your lock. So you really do have to consider every single instance that can go wrong and make sure you avoid that going wrong. You don't see, yeah. Mm -mm. I, I mean, I hope I don't really have to use C. For my assumption, like most companies don't use C. It has to be something that like really requires the speed of C for I think it to be the language of choice. Okay, fine. I guess I'll add another case here. If biggest equals C. Not C? No, not C. <laughs> Always close. That's, that's a good... Mm. I should have seen that one coming. Okay. Uh, biggest equals zero. Return false. Else. Return true here. And we're going to return false here from this one. Yeah, now working with C has been... My result was expected to be false. Okay, so the biggest... Is it just by more than two times? My result was false, expected to be true. So 15, 6, 12, 18. There are better languages like Rust, which is so similar to C in every possible way. I think the reason that people keep going back to C is because it was like one of the first languages and I mean it's I can I can see the appeal of writing in C you know you you don't have to there's never been a time of like okay well what does like this do because you're doing everything yourself which kind of sucks but at the same time you always know what's going on and you know that if something has gone wrong it's pretty much your fault and there's no one else you can blame like forgetting to malloc, like storing a variable in a pointer somewhere and then returning that pointer, but not mallocing that variable to a heap and then trying to access that data. But by pure chance, sometimes that data will get overwritten, but sometimes it won't. And the chances that it doesn't, your code runs fine. But sometimes it just gets overwritten because you didn't malloc for it. 
and then spending a couple hours figuring out that you need to go find that one thing. Mm. It takes me a couple hours minimum to get into a C mindset. And I only have to do it like every maybe two, three weeks for an assignment. So it's, it's very difficult to continue to work in it. So 15 over, I need to do like, Final castasis floating point. There you go. Are you happy now? Thank you. Yeah, it's the whole floating point. I feel like unless you're working on like military stuff where you need like super high speed or you're working in like, I don't know, like a hospital system or something maybe. I don't know. But other than that, I don't really see it too much gain from like the speed of C. However, if you are just a C dev, then it doesn't really bother you because you're so used to working in it. Okay, you were given a list of integers nums considering an operation where we select some subset of integers in the list and increment them all by one. Return the minimum number of operations needed to make all values in the list equal to each other. Okay, so the minimum number of operations here will be Super high speed, yeah, bring the assembly language. Did I, if I ever have to write another line of assembly, I, mm, I, I never want to go back to writing assembly. Let me see if I can drag this over real quick. Um, let me see if I can pull up an image here. Um, one of the infrastructures that we had, one of the, I guess, not infrastructures, but I don't even know what you would call it, that we had to work with in university. It was, um, so LC3, it's like an architecture that doesn't even exist. However, it's like its own little thing. And we were pretty, at some point writing, not assembly, you know, you have your, like your, you know, you have C up here somewhere with your languages, you have assembly further down, and then assembly gets converted straight up into machine code. So for one assignment, right, we were writing this just straight up ones and zeros looking at like a reference chart for what the instruction does and spending hours writing straight up binary code <laughs> and it's just not fun I like I understand I can after writing the binary code it really made me appreciate like having even basic assembly instructions <laughs> but yeah writing binary codes is something I'm really glad we never have to do so minimum number of operations in this case, I think, will be the difference between min and max. And I really think that should just be it. Because if we have a 0 and a 3, it's going to take at least 3 operations to either bring 3 down or bring 0 up. And everything else, we don't really have to worry about. I accept that you're a talented guy, not for me. Hey man, I was not a talented guy, man. It was a nightmare to get through that class. We had two classes based on um, like machine organization, system architecture, you know, like binary. It was it was very useful information, but having to write code in pure binary was just not it. The one thing that I did find very very interesting was the uh, I triple E seven five four standard for storing for storing floating point values in binary. It, it's very, very cool, and I'll leave the actual sort of research for anybody who is interested, but in it boils down to using a very specific, um, very specific layout of your 32-bit uh, inner value to be able to store like very large decimal points. It's a very, very efficient way to do it, but again, on a test saying, hey, convert this floating point number to the IEEE 754 notation or vice versa. Not it, it's just not it. But I made it through the class, I passed, and uh, that's, that's as far as I'm willing to take that part. Okay, now I can just leak code and go work in probably C Sharp in Microsoft if I join. Int men equals nums at zero. Int max equals nums at zero as well. And we're gonna just traverse through everything and so for int i in nums, we're just going to say min equals map dot min of itself and num and i. 
can do the same thing for Max. Yeah, it's one of those things where writing in assembly, writing in binary, and writing in all these things isn't something I did because it was fun, it's something I needed to do to pass a class, and I have yet to touch it since. Uh, let's see. Uh, return uh, max minus min. I really think that should be it for this problem. Cool, yeah. And I think the nice thing here is by doing it this way, it is a bit more work to write. However, uh, it does bring our time complexity down from n log n to just n for the sort. Because if we really wanted to, we could just do this. Uh, raise our sort nums and return nums at nums dot length minus nums at zero. This will allow us to just return the exact same thing, but it will be slower, a lot slower. And if we did want to, actually this is a sort in place, it doesn't actually do anything. So yeah, this is the slower kind of trash way to do it and we're not gonna do it that way. There we go. And we're going to uncomment this solution because this solution is the better one. Cool. Let's see what our third question here is. Linked list to zigzag tree path. Mm, okay. So given a singly linked list node, convert it to a binary tree path using these rules. The head of the linked list is the root. Each subsequent node is the left child of the parent. If its value is smaller, otherwise. So this is like building out a BST from a uh, linked list, but not. All right, let's go ahead and I guess we're gonna do this iteratively. So we're gonna do a tree head equals new tree of node.val. And we're gonna keep a current pointer, which is gonna currently be pointing to head. It's kind of interesting because I guess pointer isn't even the right terminology here in, uh, because in, I think in C they're pointers because they actually point to memory. But in, uh, in Java, since it's all like OOP, it's like a reference to an object. So I guess that isn't the right way to do it. So now we're going to do while node. Oh, let's make sure we move node along as well. Equals node.next. Yeah, we have pointers in C. And it's the hardest thing for me to like visualize has been uh, something for example when you let's say you want an array of strings you can do it I think as like uh, the syntax is really weird here it's like a car like strings for example like that or you could store it as a like a 2d like a pointer to a pointer for a string because I because strings in C aren't objects, they're just pointers to like a null terminated character, like string array thing. So by pointing to that first pointer, you can technically have like a array of strings notated as a pointer to a pointer. And this is, it was so confusing to like wrap my head around. So well node does not equals null. We're gonna keep going and we're gonna keep actually, if node.val equals is less than cur.val. So if it's less than the value of its parent, it is a left child. So we're gonna do this to say root uh, cur.left is equal to new tree with node.val. Else, uh, we also need to just move this along, so cur equals cur.left. Make sure we move it in the correct direction. Let's go ahead and copy all this code because I'm too lazy to retype it. And we're going to say cur.right, and we're going to move it along to the right. 
This is a very, very easy problem. I'm not sure why it's considered a medium. Binary search is kind of interesting in the way that it scores problems. Um, so return head. Because if it has anything to do with like a bigger data structure, it'll always, almost always be a medium. Even if it is a simple problem like this. And I might have, um, yeah, I forgot to do node equals node dot next. There we go. Mm -hmm. Always forgetting null checks. Do I just return, what do I return here? Null. Cool. That should about do it. Cool, that works. Very slow somehow though. <laughs> Classic null, yeah, it's always, always a null. Okay, let's see what we got in this last problem. <laughs> Count substrings with all ones. You're given a string containing ones and zeros. Return the number of substrings containing only ones. Mod the result by... Mod the result by... Oh. Okay, so I'm curious about the topics for this one. Strings and math, okay. Um, so I think that this one can actually have a O of N solution. It's one, okay, so there's no point in like recursively, you know, like we start here, one, two, three, start here, one, two, three. Yep. Yep, I'll be waiting. So if we do a traversal, right? Let's say we iterate through. And then what we do is when we find a one, we count uh, we count how many ones are in a row and I think what we can maybe maybe do here is say the amount of ones for that substring is num of ones factorial sense in my head because if we look at this solution right there's three three factorial three times two times one which is six one times well, one for factorial is going to be just one i so i think that could be it let's give it a shot why not so Let's see, let's see, let's see. So for int i equals zero, i is less than s dot length. So let's keep track of int sum equals zero, as well as int cur ones equals zero.
So I guess there's only two conditions really. So if s dot pair at i equals a one, we're gonna do one thing else, we do something else. If it's a one, all we really wanna do is just do cur ones plus plus, right? Uh, I'm gonna write out a method to calculate the factorial down here. So public So public int factorial of, let's say, int count. So we're going to do while count greater than zero. Result equals one. <clears throat> Result multiplies by count as well as reducing it by one. If this works, I'll be quite surprised, because I mean, I picked up on this, like, out of nowhere. Return result, I think would be it. Let's go ahead and do sum plus equals uh, factorial. Confused about why that is uh, public. That's probably why. Makes sense as to why that wasn't blue. of cur ones, cur ones equals zero. Not one, why am I returning one? <laughs> Return sum. not a property it's a method there we go that does not work okay my result was zero why is my result zero here mm. it's always this like little fence post to account for that last one. Ooh. okay That makes sense. Okay, so now if cur1 is greater than zero, then we can do this summing. My result is still equal to one. So why is my result equal to one? Where exactly are we summing? Oh, I guess if I just add this conditional here. Because if it's not greater than zero, we don't want to add anything. Still no, wow, okay. So, I guess my factorial logic is flawed then. <laughs> Thank you.
It's a really good song. Okay, so let's go ahead back because I mean the infrastructure here is in place. We just need to correctly count the amount we have. So we have one, this can produce one substring, right? Two can produce three substrings because we can, so we can have one, one can produce one, one, and one, one. Three can produce, oh, you can produce one, 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 and then one, 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 like that, I think. Which is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, four is gonna be a bit tedious here, but it can do four ones, it can do three twos, two separate types of three, and one type of four which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this goes from one, two, three, to six, to ten. What kind of pattern do we have going here? I think it's the biggest question. Am I getting it right? Yeah, because there's two threes. There's uh, three separate ways you could do that, and then four separate individual ones. But how do we actually find the pattern here? So I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> very great hint. Very, very, very useful hint if I do say so myself. Okay. How do we count this pattern? How do we count this pattern? Five, right? So there's one, two, three, four, five ones. Okay, what if instead of doing this, right, we count how many of we count how many of each type, right? So there's one one here. There's two one and one, two, for the, the three ones, which is just uh, one, one, one. How did I? Okay, I want these to be indented the same amount, is all I want here. You know what? Fine, fine. Do whatever you want back there. Okay. So then there's three ones, uh, two twos, as well as one three. As well, okay, so. It looks like the amount of what the pattern here. So I'll just write this again. So there's four ones, then three twos, then two threes, and one four. So is it? 
So 4 plus 3 is 7 plus 2 plus 1. So I think what we need to do is replace this factorial method to say um, a while per 1 greater than 0. So it's not even multiplication, it's just, let's just call this one like sum up. Because all this is going to do is plus equals count. There we go. I think that should just do it, honestly. Got him. Yeah, that pattern took a bit to find. Definitely helped to write it out, though. Wait, three ones, two twos. There you go. I'm going to take a bit of a break here, and then I'm going to come back and try and either A, optimize these solutions, or try and come up with a time-space complexity for them. Okay, let's see what we can do to either optimize these or... What if, okay, I have a this genius idea, right? We don't even need this method. We can do um, to zero, we can do that, right? And we just do sum plus equals per ones. This one doesn't even need to make this method call. Neither does that. Should still work. And it should run considerably faster. Because we can count it up as we go. There's no need to go back and count it up after. There we go. Cool. Should do that. Okay, uh, we can, I'll leave this here as like a sort of guide almost for the, for the future for myself. Very simple solution, very simple question, getting the pattern. Yeah, 82%, yeah. Finally got to one of your streams. Yeah, I'm trying to do 10.30, yeah, 10.30 p.m. PST for fixing my sleep schedule. It's, yeah, I've been trying to do the same, honestly. I need to stop, I need to start waking up earlier and going to sleep earlier. It's not much to shift back maybe by like a couple hours, but it's still very difficult to do. <laughs> 10, 12 p.m. for me, wow. Right, okay. That makes more sense. Yeah, it's currently what, 11, 12 a.m.? So that's what, 11 out? I think 11 hours ahead you are. Okay, let's go ahead and go back. It's AM. Yeah, I'm like on the complete opposite end. Complete opposite end. So, okay, I guess let's go ahead and go back to to studying this time complexity. So for this question, um, there's obviously a O of n log n time solution where we just sort the list and 
and take the last two elements. I used to sleep at 7 a.m. and wake up at 3 p.m. So I said I'd fix my... Oh, okay. So that would be 3 p.m. That's a very big difference. That's what, seven hours changed? In fact, there's a very tech savvy, very good friend of mine that is good in academics. Taught him big O notation someday between the discussion. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> <Yeah. laughs> now it's good because it helps us solve math questions and big exams. Mm. Really? I would not have guessed that it'd be useful anywhere other than like. Just purely CS. So, okay. This one, we're going to avoid sorting the list and instead just do a O of N traversal. We're going to create variables to store the biggest and smallest ones. We're then going to iterate through and just keep track of what the biggest and second biggest is. This is just an edge case to deal with one of them being zero because divide by zero does not work very well with computers. And we're going to return this division here. The reason we're doing floating point division is because we need something to see if it's larger than, if it's more than two times bigger, not more than or equal to. And some things are, let's say 2.8, 2.9, 2.99, does not matter how close they are to three integer division will floor the value, which means that um, if it is going to be less than, if it's greater than two, but less than three, it'll always be two, which gives us some weird inputs. So by casting this, we end up with like, you know, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, or whatever that value is, and we just return it. So I think it's O of N time with O of one space for those constant variables that we use. And I really think that should just be it there. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. This one, we could have done a very, very similar thing. What is the estimated time you think it will be? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm guessing it would be O of N because we're traversing it, we're iterating through it in linear time. Great. So this one, once again, we could do the same thing where we sort the list and grab the first and last element and find their difference. Because the minimum number of operations entirely depends on what the biggest and smallest values are here. Because if we have, uh, kind of like I mentioned earlier in the example, if we have the biggest value at three and the smallest at zero, regardless of if we move this one up or move this one down, it'll take three operations total. So we need to make sure that we actually, you know, keep track of what the biggest and smallest is. One way obviously is to do it this way, but this way was slow and we're not doing that because we can optimize it by using something very similar to this first problem. It's almost the exact same problem, except instead of keeping track of the biggest and uh, second biggest, we instead keep track of the min and the max. So we just check every element in O of N time find the min and the max of the whole array and we just return their difference. That allows us to find the minimum number of operations. What makes this question super simple is the fact that we select any subset of integers that we want. Reminds me of my faster than 5% solution in Ruby. <laughs> yeah, this here, 64% fa faster than 64% doing it this way. And then doing it this way, I think it drops to like 30%. Yeah, not a particularly fast solution. <clears throat> cool, so moving forward, linked to zigzag tree path. Zigzag tree path is pretty much just like very poorly building out a binary search tree. Um, pretty much any time we, we take a linked list and we wanna convert it into a tree, but anytime the value is less than the parent, we want it on the left. Anytime it's greater than or equal to, we want it on the right. So we are going to do this by the yeah, longest consecutive duplicate string problem I solved. Yeah, that one was, it was very long in Ruby. 
from, from what I remember. So yeah, we're going to pretty much convert, make a new node, make a new tree node, tree root, whatever you want, tree node, whatever, to store the head, to give you a hint, O of N memory. See if I can actually pull that up. Uh, so longest consecutive duplicate string. <clears throat> All right, so we pretty much have these two reference the same head node. We move the node along, and while there are still nodes in our linked list, we pretty much check is its value less than the parent, or is it greater than or equal to? If it's less, we put it on the right, and we move. We put it on the left if it's less. We put it on the right if it's more, and we just move along. This problem is one of those where I don't know if this is considered O of n space or O of one space because. We directly need, there's no way to avoid making a tree node for every regular node. Problem Python, interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is O of N space or O of one space. I'll write it in, uh, so O of N time, that's for sure. But O of N or one space, I'm not sure, really not sure because are we, I guess it would be O of N, but we aren't using any quote unquote extra space for our solution. We are using what's needed to return the correct data type. I'll just make that a question. Okay, and let's go ahead and move on to this next one. This one, very simple question once you understand the pattern because the, point, the goal here is to figure out, <clears throat> um, return the number of substrings that contain only one. And those substrings can be of any size, meaning, you know, if there's like a length of three, it can be a length of one, length of two, length of three. So what I did was I wrote out the total number of, um, I guess total number of substring per length of, per length of, ones so for example with one singular one we have this with two ones we have this with three ones and so on and so forth because initially my intuition was that it was a factorial what if you can do this faster than o of n uh i the the only way i could think of to do it faster than o of n would be to somehow um heck i don't know like we can't really use a binary search to find the total number of ones here, though maybe we could, but the only, the O of N for this one comes from the faster way is a bit hack that I used in fast inverse square root. Oh, dude, the fast inverse square root algorithm was, was wild. Like watching it, like, especially the comments that the devs left. Hold on, let me pull that up. fast inverse the quake 3 algorithm where was it there's there it is there's our fast inverse square root yeah the, the evil floating point big bit hack yeah it's uh here hold up yeah it's uh i can just zoom in on the uh, i won't let me zoom in on just the code <laughs> let's do let's do open image and new tab and just zoom in on the code right here because yeah, this, this line right here was, was genius from what I understood. Yeah, because it's so weird because you want to store like the bits for the long without actually like storing a long, I think. Yeah, this, dude, this, this entire like algorithm is just wild. The fact that it took like a 20, what was it? Like a 10, 20 minute video to explain it. Because yeah, th but the, I think legit the most fascinating thing was this line where you take the direct value at the address of Y, you cast it to a long pointer, and then you get a pointer to that. Because I think what it does is it tells C that the memory stored at that address is, I, I don't even remember, man, but it was super cool. 
uh, yeah, if anybody's interested in seeing how this all worked, I can actually just link the YouTube video. It's, um, I think it was called like the fast inverse square root. It's a very, very interesting, it's a 20 minute video on these like very few lines of code, but it's, I, I would guarantee, I guarantee it's worth your watch. It's a very, very interesting video. Okay. <clears throat> Say a once for this one, that evil bit hack thing, I, I guess the other way you could do it is instead of utilizing this for loop like that, you could just bit shift things. And once you bit shift and you figure out that it's an odd number or even number, because you could, for example, to count the ones, you could just keep shifting right. If mod two equals zero, then last bit is zero, else it's a one. And you can use that to count the bits instead of using carat, which I assume would be faster and more efficient, but it's... But yeah, I think that really is... I think that really is it for this one. All right, man, I... Wow, seven viewers, that is... It's always towards the end when I'm finishing up, kind of going over solutions that my viewership jumps up. Why am I so good at distracting the streamers unintentionally? Yeah, it's it's a very interesting algorithm. And I, I don't know, I, I enjoy watching videos on other like algorithms and solutions and things like that. Because it really does help to sometimes give you ideas on what you can pursue. But, hey, it's Colonial. Thanks for the follow, man. I really appreciate it. I unfortunately will have to cut it probably here today a little bit short. I have a meeting set up to try and figure out this whole multi-threading deadlock issue I'm having. I've sunk way more hours into this like producer-consumer based style assignment than I'd like to admit. Definitely gives me an idea about how to make algorithms. Oh, absolutely. Like what about that does not like, or, or, you know, um, three half, I think this is just like Newton's like approximation or like. So, someone's approximation of like a something the fact that the man's defined a constant for three halves but then proceeded to shove this hex that's a hex like value in here couldn't define that as a constant either overall i don't understand enough c to explain this it's confusing there's a 20 minute video that's gonna do a great job of explaining it but yeah, that's going to be it for me today. Thanks everyone who stopped by. I'll be back hopefully tomorrow, 10.30 a.m. PST. Yeah, yeah, I've watched it more times than I probably can count at this point. It's nice because you can just listen to it. Don't even really have to look. All right, yeah. Thanks everyone for stopping by, and I'll see you all tomorrow.